um, emptying yourself, hiding official glory, divesting yourself of the visible glory so that people might see the Lord by his nature. And it begins, you know, you, you really see it obviously in chapter 2 when he starts telling you, let this mind be in you. And then it, what does it say? Then it says, well, Jesus did this. He was God, but he did not fight to be equal with God. And he gave up, he divested himself of his visible glory and became as a man and made himself of no reputation and on and on and on. Then you get into the third chapter and you find it begins the same way and that Paul, except for now it's not talking about Jesus, but Paul. And so Paul goes through the same process and he goes through this same thing the things that were gained to me, the th you know, I was a, a Pharisee and I was a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, of the stock of Israel, uh, uh, as uh, a Hebrew of the Hebrews and concerning Zia, all this stuff, all this official glory stuff, he addresses it the same manner as Jesus. In other words, this thing works. It actually passes down. Is that good news to anybody? It actually works, and he passes down, and, and Paul is declaring of himself the same in chapter 3, what Jesus declared of, uh, was, what was declared of Jesus in chapter 2, and that is, I've also given up all of my official glory and all of the things that I, and now all I want to know is Christ. I want to be made conformable to his death. I want to be, I want to be seen in the power of his resurrection. I don't want to be seen in light of my official glory and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> And so in chapter 4, uh, in verse um, 12, uh, 12 and 13, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Um, <clears throat> Jesus never sought for official glory even at times where the situation called for it he didn't seek for official glory now that's important because there were times like at the transfiguration that the father gave him glory and honor can i get amen on that but he didn't seek for that because as son of man you you that's your whole that's your whole task that's your mission that's your life that's your nature to not do that. So, there were, but there were times where it was completely appropriate for Jesus to receive official glory, but even in those times, he didn't seek for it. <clears throat> uh, there are those who may not go out and seek official glory, but they are very hurt when it does not come to them when they think it is due. In other words, well, I agree with that statement that I just made. I don't seek for official glory, but doggone it, it ought to come to me when, I, when it's due. Okay? And this is pretty much what this class is going to be about. <clears throat> Focusing in and honing in on this specific area. <clears throat> uh, the world operates by polluted, mo polluted motives, but he does not. He is a perfect offering. And again, when I... any. Uh, uh, time I allude to the offerings in this, I'm seeing this pure offering, particularly this meat offering that's going up and that is, that is, that, that is not mixed with human honey and as that won't allow all these other things. It'll just be a pure offering of what the Father wants. <clears throat> and um, uh, so he's a perfect offering. Though Jesus never sought official glory, yet he will, he will acknowledge it to the degree that they acknowledge it. Jesus rises to the need around him. <clears throat> and though sometimes people around him would force him down, you know, I'm fixing to make that statement, but I think it'd be really good to look at this in the scriptures. Turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 9. You know, I'm just reminded as uh, Nicole comes into the room that they they brought back John the head, John the Baptist's head on a silver platter, <laughs> and I'm just thinking, is is it me, Lord? <laughs> okay, Luke chapter nine. Now this is this 
is really, really, really good because uh, this is the same chapter that the transfiguration happened. This is the same chapter just before the transfiguration that he says, if any man will come out after me, let him deny himself, take up the cross. This is all not related to the cost of discipleship. That's the little title somebody put over it. This is not the cost of discipleship. This is the cost of being a son of God. This is the cost of living as son of man in the earth. This is the cost of receiving his nature. Then it goes into the transfiguration, and then Jesus says, now don't tell anybody. Three people see it, and he tells them don't tell anybody because he's not seeking glory through that means. And had they been disobedient and done it, it would have ruined many people and stopped them from seeing him by his nature. Um, and in this, just before the scriptures we're about to read, there arises this thing about who should be the greatest among the disciples. And Jesus is going, you don't get it. You don't get it. You don't seem to get it. You still think it's about official glory. So amazingly, I mean, this whole chapter, but obviously the whole book, but this whole chapter keeps pushing this thing of... <clears throat> It's not about official glory. It's about the glory of nature and allowing his nature to be seen, honored, and glorified. Therefore, every knee shall bow. <clears throat> and so then we come to verse 49, Luke chapter 9, verse 49. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one. <clears throat> let's see. Let's go, to, let's go to 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. <clears throat> Excuse me. He, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into, the, into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. Now I'm just going to ask you, what does that sound like? That, th that this man is coming to this town and he sends messengers before his face to make ready for them. Uh, <clears throat> what does that sound like? It sounds like the coming of some dignitary or some king, <coughs> doesn't it? Because with his men, they accepted him as Lord and them disciples because he was honored among them and they would do that and they would go. And here he's, he, there is some form, if it fits and it's, not, and it's not contrary, he will receive official glory, but he didn't seek it out and he didn't order it. People give it, that's their business, but he didn't seek it out and he didn't order it. But look what happens. <clears throat> Verse uh, 53, and they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elijah did? <clears throat> but he turned and rebuked them and said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's life, but to save them, and they went to another village. <coughs> uh, the statement that I wanted to read was this. And though sometimes people around him would force him down to a lower place other than what he deserved, he knew how to be abased. Remember, we, read, we started this reading Philippians 4, that he knows how to be abased and he knows how to abound. Folks, nobody needs to teach you how to abound. But we need to learn how to be abased. We need to learn how to be abased. <clears throat> um, and though sometimes people around him would force him down to a lower place other than what he deserved, he knew how to be abased. He did not feel the need to force his way to a higher place, but would be drawn forth by the need and the misery. He would assume the form he was allowed. He knew how to be abased. To learn this requires the circumstances where you are first exalted by them and then by them be put down. First exalted. The only way you're going to learn this is that kind of setting where you are first exalted by people and then put down. That's how you learn to be abased. 
Okay? That's how you learn that official glory is not your calling card. <clears throat> okay? It's not, you don't put your name on that calling card. Your calling card is the, the, the glory of nature. And if they don't see it, then you give that nature by being abased and not fighting for your place. <clears throat> when the Samaritans are excited with his coming, he sends people before, them, before him. But when they would not receive him, because they were going to receive him, it said in the verse before <clears throat> that he set his face as though he would go to Jerusalem. Had he not set his face as though he would go to Jerusalem, they would have received him. Do you understand? That's the, that's the deal. That was the thing that precipitated them taking the honorable great one that was coming to their city and not even receiving him now. Okay. <clears throat> So let me read it again. When the, the Samaritans are excited with his coming, he sends feet, people before him. But when they would not receive him, uh, but, when, but they would not receive him. But he accepts his place at once without murmuring. And he does. He just goes, oh, okay, this, you know, that's fine. And so they went to another city. They didn't, weren't going to receive him. And he didn't say, you idiots. And not only that, but the disciples did. Do you want us to, you know, do you want us to rain down fire on it? Well, you've got power. God's your father. We got power here. Power, miracles. He, we can do stuff here. Let's. But if he did, that wouldn't have been virtue coming out of him. Been power coming out of him. Wrong motive. <clears throat> And so he rebukes them. These people, these Samaritans, aren't receiving Jesus. They're the ones who need to be rebuked. No, no. These are in training to understand what being a son of God as son of man means of making yourself of no reputation, of of veiling your official glory and living Christ so that if they see Christ, then Christ is glorified for who he is, not what he does. And the question must be begged then, what is it of the Lord we're really seeking? Are we really seeking for him to be known or for us to be known? For him to be glorified for who he is or for us to be glorified because we're connected with him, therefore we receive higher official glory than we would have otherwise. It's a bad thing to teach the Lamb of God as nature. It's a bad thing because you have to live it, or you should. You know, and therefore if you're going to teach the Lamb, then you, it's contrary to try to gain the glory of, of uh, the Lamb apart from every knee bowing to that nature that was veiled and, and hid, divested himself of his official glory. Well, Jesus did it. We, said, we saw in chapter 2, Jesus did it. We saw in chapter 3, Paul did it. And then by chapter 4, he's dealing with us to do it. And then there is no chapter 5. <clears throat> it's a progression. It's a progression. And all those that are his will have to learn how to be abased and how to do it in the correct spirit. Not, not just being abased, but, you know, it's not just learning to be, quote, unquote, put down. That's not what we're saying here. We're saying what we've been saying the whole semester. We're saying that you, you are... Uh, partakers of his mission and his spirit. His mission to be the son of man, not the son of God. And his spirit that is willing to, uh, that is rather willing to not be known on any official level so that the few that would receive you would receive you by the nature of Christ. Is that, is that clear? It, it is? Yes. 
convinced that because Jesus was his son, he's always trying to think, I mean, I think on this personal practical level that if you're being abased, you can take it personally or you can just take it because you're Jesus and you're one with him. <clears throat> and maybe when Jesus wasn't received, he was just thinking, well, they're not receiving my father. And the only thing I care about is expressing him, not really anything else about how I'm received or what people think. Yeah. Sorry, I was trying to look here. Um... Um, I was thinking of this <clears throat> this situation in Matthew 2 <clears throat> where uh, Jesus is born and, and Matthew 2 begins with the wise men coming <clears throat> and they're giving him official glory and they're honoring him <clears throat> uh, and the, wor the beginning words are, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Okay. That signals to us the birth of the son of David. That signals to us the, the birthplace of the Messiah that all Israel looked for. Amen? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> um, Uh, verse 12, <clears throat> and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed in their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring word, for Herod will seek the young child. <clears throat> when he arose, <clears throat> he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod. <clears throat> Uh, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Out of Egypt. Not out of Bethlehem. We'll see, we'll see this more. So then Herod, when he saw that, he was, that he was mocked by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and you know the rest. He went down and he killed everybody in Bethlehem, all the children from two years old and younger. <clears throat> And um, <clears throat> then verse 19. And when Herod was dead, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for, for they are dead who sought the young child. And he arose, and he took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. And when he heard that Archelaus... Uh, did reign in Judea in the place of his father, Herod. He was afraid to go there, notwithstanding, notice, into Judea, Judah, Bethlehem. Beth, go back to Bethlehem. He was going to, he was going to, uh, in the place of his father, Herod. He was afraid to go there, notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth. All right. Uh, let me just read this, because uh, I wrote in my notes, and they're not as plain as they should be, but I simply put in parentheses, Nazarene or Bethlehemite? What is he? He takes his place as the Nazarite if they will not accept him as the Bethlehemite. Upon entrance into the Samaritan village that we talked about, he readily takes his place, but adjusts quickly on the far side of the village. <clears throat> um, See, so I've got a bunch of scriptures that I was trying to do a search on this thing. Um, and I, you know, the problem is I, my notes aren't as good as normal. Um, uh, 
uh, I just jotted down Matthew 21, and it was it's talking about the triumphal entry. <clears throat> um, and basically, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's a long thing, but I'll just basically tell you this. Uh, Matthew 21 begins with the, <clears throat> the triumphal entry where everyone's calling, you know, Hosanna to the king and, uh, uh, you know, Blessed be the, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And it's, and it's this official glory that's going on. But it's only a triumphal entry because at the end of that day, he ends up going and sleeping outside of the city. He doesn't sleep in Jerusalem that was honoring him. Oh, you know, and all the honor and all the stuff that they were doing. It's as if he comes into this official glory and passes right through it and then goes out with, with, with his disciples alone and they go out onto another town outside of it. The party's over. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that was, that was the thing I was seeing there. And then in Matthew 20, I wish I had written all these verses down. Um, um, I don't have it, but it goes along with this because I was seeing this connection here. He enters the city as the son of David in the triumphal entry. He enters the city as the son of, he accepts the dignity of it. But when the situation demands it, he adjusts and thinks it not robbery. But the unbelief of Jerusalem, like the Samaritans, changes the scene. Did you catch that? The unbelief of Jerusalem, in this case, just like the Samaritans when they were at one place and then all of a sudden they change, it changes the scene. The one who enters the city as king now leaves it and seeks his own lodging elsewhere. Again, he is outside of Jerusalem. He, is, he, he knows how to be abased. He, he knows how to be a base in a real way. He really, really does. Yes, Kelly? Yes. yes. But my point is, he enters Jerusalem triumphantly as the son of David. And he leaves with his disciples and goes to be, has to sleep in Bethany that night. <clears throat> um. If it is a, a case of the darkness not comprehending his light, of his official glory, the glory of his self-giving nature will not be dampened. We are different, however. We want to be recognized for our official glory, who I am, what I know. I'm a son of God. And if someone doesn't recognize that by, you know, whatever beams we can put out of official glory, <laughs> it's the only way I know how to put it, then we get upset. <clears throat> um, never mind, I'm not going to say that. He's not afraid of official glory, but it will always take a back seat to the glory of nature. The minute that men disavow his official glory, he ceases to push for it. He veils it and takes his place as the Nazarene. Yes. Right. Because it's only based on externals. You have the power, you have this, you have that. But none of those things describe you. You know. Seeing, uh, you know, seeing this city called New Jerusalem walled and all you see is a river coming out from it, bringing heat, you know, and from that eventually the flow ends with healing to the nations. All you see is what you, you know, a source. You don't see a lamb on a throne on the inside. You see what I'm saying? 
you just see out of that, you know. But, but the reality is, is that that New Jerusalem, that Zion, out of Zion, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, because you don't see her, she's veiled, and you see transparent glass, and you see the lamb on the throne, you see the source, you see the nature of it, you see that it's not just a miracle flowing out to me, thank, thank God, you see that it's not just a, a divine intervention flowing out, thank God that God is all powerful, you see a self-giving being out of Zion is the perfection of beauty. Beauty perfected, where she's so transparent that you don't just see Jesus. Because people can say, you know, I see Jesus in you, and what they mean is you could, you could walk up and give them, you know, a hundred bucks for a need that you felt led of God, and they say, I see Jesus in you. They may not see a selfless, self-giving nature. They just may see a need met and call that Jesus. It's not Jesus, it's deity. It's God having the power to do it. That's different than seeing the selfless one on the throne of her heart, and she is so transparent. But, you know, and when we say transparent, here's what I want to say, because, you know, New Jerusalem is made of transparent glass where you can see within her and you see Jesus and you see, you see the lamb. You see the lamb on the throne. To be transparent, what is the translation of that in light of what we're sharing? She hid any glory that she had that the nature might be seen within her. The glory of nature is her glory. That's the perfection of beauty right there. Not I, Paul said, but Christ liveth in me. And he's seen, and he's seen for who he is. And not everybody will see him in you for who he is, but they sure won't if your walls are plastered with, you know, banners of all of your official glory. How can they see past all of that to see the one on the throne on the inside and to see that it's a lamb? Can I get amen? How can they? They cannot. They cannot. They might partake of the pure river. They might drink it. They might partake of the fruit of the tree of life that's a result of that. But they cannot see in purity and in clarity who it is that's on that throne in nature. They won't see it. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, So I'll read this again. He is not afraid of official glory, but it will always take a back seat to the glory of nature. The minute men disavow his official glory, he ceases to push for it. He veils it. He takes his place as the Nazarene. And, you know, that was part of the argument that was going around about Jesus. Did you know that? That was part of the argument that was going around about Jesus. Uh, he's the Messiah. He's the one, he's the promised one, which means what? What are they saying in a short, real, succinct way? He's the Bethlehemite. He's the Bethlehemite. But the other said, look in the Bible, look in the scriptures. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Jesus never said, dudes, I was born in Bethlehem. But it does say when things got rough in Jerusalem that he went to his hometown of Nazareth. The Nazarite came home. He didn't find, and he was, in reality, he wasn't a Nazarite. He wasn't, he wasn't from Nazareth. 
He was born in Bethlehem. He was a Bethlehemite. He was the Messiah. He was all of that. He never fought for that, and he never heard, you know, I mean, the, the disciples heard it. Surely Jesus heard it. They wrote it down, but he, it's never came and said, I am the Bethlehemite, because that would have been not veiling his official glory. If you consider me to be the Nazareth, from Nazareth, then see my nature towards you. See my selflessness and make your determination. Not based on where I was born. Bethlehem. Not based on official glory. Bethlehem. But find me. And I believe that's because Jesus said to the disciples, who do men say that I am? He's constantly saying, find me, discover me. But men, as we saw in John 6, men didn't. They, dis they wanted to discover this, you know, show us a sign. They wanted him to do something for them to prove that he was of God. And Jesus never catered to that. He simply and and there were, there are people, folks, that will never see Jesus in you, and they will take and take and take and take and take and take and take, and they will. There are users out there; they will do that. But it doesn't change Jesus' mission, Jesus' nature, Jesus' mission as the Son of Man, Jesus' nature to hide his official glory so that if, and like I said, he is constantly crying out in spirit, know me, discover, not just know me, discover me. You know, I mean, I want to say it like that because we talk about knowing the Lord all the time. We talk about, you know, trying to tell everybody, you got to know the Lord and everything. But in truth, we have to discover the Lord for who he is and as, you know, I've said a lot of my classes lately, you know, every circumference has its center. And the center of all of it is who he is, and that <coughs> explains what he does. But if you don't know who he is, all you know is all of the things in the circumference. And you never discover the center, but every circumference has a center. And so that center is crying out, that central core is crying out, discover me. And not just, and, and that's not just listen to me. That is go to the word, go to your knees, go to the spirit of God and say, open my eyes to discover the core of this one. Because Copying the, the, the account in the Gospels is not going to hack it. Copying the circumference of what he did and how, you know, the different things like that is not going to get it. Because he can give and give and give. He can do a miracle. He can do a healing and all that stuff. And you'll just call it power. He'll call it virtue out from his selfless core that gave it to you. Virtue went out of me, he would say. Not power. Selflessness went out of me to you and to your need and to your cry and to your sorrow. And not power, not the power of God, but the selflessness of the Lamb. Discover me, know me. Is his heart cry? Is his heart cry? And if we will, we will have to get past all things relating to official glory. And we'll have to see him in his humility. He, as I said last class, he is not wanting to be discovered in his glory, but in his humility. There you will see the lamb. All right. Whoa. He 
takes his place as the Nazarene. He would embrace the official glory when offered, but never sought it. And I've said that over and over, but I just think it's just incredibly important that we realize that God has every right to put you in situations of official glory if he wants to. He did it to Jesus several times. But we have no right to let that go to our head and think that that's what it's all about. Every knee shall bow to the Son of Man who humbled himself and became obedient unto death for others. It's just the way it is. He never sought it because if people gave him official... Now, here's, here's the key. If people gave him official glory without the true reason for giving official glory, then to him it's not glory at all. It is man-made homage, man-made obeisance, but it is not true glory because to him, now we're, we're, you know, you say, well, are you speaking for God? Well, I, my God, I hope I am. You know, if I'm not, we need to shut this place down. As far as I know and as much as I have searched and spent my life to know the Lord, my understanding, not that it's great or better than anybody else or even right, but my understanding is That anything that is glory that does not come from nature is not glory at all to him. And that's my understanding. That it is self-serving obeisance. But it's not glory. He gets no glory out of it. And he came down here as the express image of God to express, to express the image of God, not the official powers, the official place, position, the official abilities. He veiled every ounce of that. He veiled every ounce of that. When you walked into the tabernacle and you walked up to that final veil, you looked and you could not see the one who was behind that. You only saw the veil, his flesh. And hopefully God would open your eyes. And that's what the revelation of Christ is. It's not just ripping open a veil. It's God unveiling. It's God opening your eyes to what's back there, not him ripping it open and going, okay, you removed everything and now I see you in your true glory. The true glory that you should have already seen that opens that isn't this brightness and this glory of this supreme being that is be, you know, above and beyond anything like us and just beautiful and powerful and everything. That's... He's not going to open the veil for you to see that. The veil is open because you saw the nature of it, and when, the, when it does come open, you see right past all of the, the things for which carnal man would honor him. All of the bright, you know, you honor him because he of his nature, of his being. We call it Lamb of God around here. You could call it any number of things. You could just call it good old-fashioned humility. I mean, in, in true humility. You could call it any number of things. We chose Lamb, and there's a, there's a precedent for that. But in one sense, it's better not to call it anything and say, discover that. Whatever's back there. Have your eyes open so that when the actual veil is rent, you, you are not wowed 
by the official reality of this one, but by the heart and the being. I know you, Lord. He does something. I know you. I know from whence that came, not I know you by what you do. You say there's a fine line there. It's the difference between actually knowing him and therefore, you see, the river that proceeds out and flows and pours forth healing to the nations is not him. It is out from him, but it's not him. Every leaf you eat of the tree of life that heals you is not him. It is out from him, but him must be discovered by the Holy Spirit. And if we don't, then all of our, you know, I read years ago, some guy wrote a book. I died and went to heaven. Told all, <laughs> told all about what heaven was like. Never really mentioned the Lord, you know. In my mind, and of course, we all know that something's wrong with my mind. So that's, so that's not a challenge to anybody. In my mind, there's something wrong with seeing the official glory of everything and not perceiving him. something wrong with it and I say I say that the beauty of the Lord is not the river the blessing of the Lord that's the river the the, the benefit that's the river but that's not the Lord. And it comes out of a throne and through a wall that is a, his bride. And you never see him unless God opens your eyes. And that's why I love that picture of the veil, his flesh. I love the picture of true revelation renting the veil instead of an actual physical renting. Because the true renting of the veil is not the seeing of God in all of his glory. The true renting of the veil is a spiritual reality that shows us who he is. And you already knew for years what he did because you walked back up and down through the altar and the laver and the showbread and you ate of it and you got light from the candlestick and you smelled it and all this was glory, 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 but there was a veil there. And there was no true glory yet. I don't know if this even makes sense to you, but I, I'm telling you the truth. I really, I know that this is the truth that the rending of the veil is not to see him in official glory. The rending of the veil is to see him. And the blessing of it on his side is that he can sit there in all official glory and we won't be motivated and moved by that. We'll just be moved by him. If offered official glory, but then withdrawn, he would always easily go lower. He knew how to be abased. Do we? In the spirit of being abased, do we know how to be abased? Not do we know how to be put down. Not do we know how to um, suffer this present treatment patiently waiting for God to show them the true official glory that is me. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? That, that I'll put up with this. No, no. 
Paul said, I've learned to be abased. I know how to do all of this. I can be, I can be exalted. I can be given official glory. And if it's taken away, I can be abased. It's just, it's not that big a deal. Yes. Gospels, there's their whole destiny is to be the place where the glory of God dwells. And so if he that misrepresents what the glory is, I mean, that is beyond tragic. I mean, here comes the glory, whatever you thought it was going to be, this is who it is. And <clears throat> the same with Christians today, this is the Jesus that's meant to fill you, whatever you want him to be or thought he was going to be, this is who he is. You were created for this glory to fill you. And you failed as a human created to be inhabited by the glory of God. You can't comprehend what that glory really is. And it's a big deal. Amen. Well, I, I thoroughly agree with that. I think that the, that the general concept in Christianity of seeing the glory of God is seeing him in such an official glory that we are overwhelmed and wowed by God. You know, it is, we're waiting for the Lord thy God to come down and do something glorious and powerful. And that's the way they talk, and that's the way, you know, and we're waiting. We're waiting for something he's never going to do. He's never going to let us see the official glory of the true fullness of him until we've seen him. He's not going to do it because he did, his mission on this earth was to veil everything that we're trying to get seen. All right, any other comments or questions? Look at us. Good timing. Father, we just ask you to do what only you can do by the power of the Spirit of God. And that's not just show us something. The, the only one able to truly get our hearts in the right place where we are pure in our motive of just really wanting to see you in your being and not what you can do for us. We serve you for many motives. But we want to be a vessel of you because of your motives. We want to be a body for you to allow your motives to flow freely through us, manifested through hands and feet, your body. But, and if no one sees you, for your true core, that we as the New Jerusalem just be faithful to allow you to flow out of us by your motives, lamb enthroned motives central inside of us. Father, grant it to this people, grant it to those who are willing to sell all And Lord, I don't just mean give up things to come to a place. Lord, I mean those who are willing to give up all of their concepts and all of their ideas, including all official glory ideas that are being sought to come to your heart and to have your heart flow through us. Father, not by might, nor by power. Not by receiving of your strength or your abilities. But by receiving of your spirit and knowing what spirit we are of. Saith the Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're dismissed.